Today we are going to be going over the last three layers of the band animations iceberg from old MTV classics like Beavis and Butthead that aged a little bit poorly to obscure episodes of childhood classics like Pingu. You will be able to find it on today's video. Let's not delay this any further and jump into layer six of the band and censored animations iceberg, comedians. To no one's surprise, yet another episode of Beavis and Butthead was censored and taken off the air. The episode in question comes from the first episode of season three titled Comedians. The plot involves the duo wanting to become comedians after they see a stand-up comedian's rich lifestyle. The two are convinced that they can become rich comedians themselves and decide to take their talents over to a local comedy club. They arrive at the club and both are booed off stage because of their lackluster jokes. Beavis attempts to juggle newspapers that are lit on fire. This leads to the club being burned down as the pair watch the fire spread ending with them doing their iconic laugh as the fire ensues. On the surface, this episode doesn't really appear to be too controversial, but it gets much more serious given the allegations that happened after the episode aired. So around one month after MTV debuted this episode of Beavis and Butthead, there was a story that came out of a five-year-old boy named Austin Messner who caused a very serious accident that led to the death of a family member. Five-year-old Austin, being, you know, a little kid, got his hands on a lighter and somehow, from playing with it, managed to burn down his entire family's trailer. And the really sad and depressing part of this story is the fact that the fire took the two-year-old sister's life. The reason that this story ties into Beavis and Butthead is because the mother of the children decided that she would claim that the episode is the reason as to why her kid even decided to do this in the first place. Stating that the kid must have watched the part where Beavis lights the newspapers on fire and then lights the comedy club on fire, giving him the inspiration to do the same actions to his family's trailer. Now at the time, this caused a media frenzy that led to MTV ultimately deciding to heavily edit versions of the episode that would run during the day and then at nighttime when you know kids would go to sleep they would air the full uncut episode the edited version would cut out the same clip of the newspapers being lit on fire and then it would simply just jump straight to the comedy club being on fire and disaster setting in without any explanation whatsoever so if you watch that episode you would be left wondering why the comedy club was on fire because there was no scene to explain it. MTV would eventually take the episode off of the air and would also make an effort to remove any reference to fire out of any future airings of any episode. All of this that you're hearing is a pretty reasonable conclusion to this story. From the episode airing to the allegations happening to MTV immediately acting and deciding to remove any references to fire. It all seems pretty reasonable. Until you realize that years later, they found out that the mother completely lied about her kids watching the show and then her kids using the show as inspiration to cause this accident to happen. A now grown up Austin Messner explained in 2008 when he was 20 years old that he literally never had cable because his drug addict mom could not afford it. So there was no way he could have watched this episode citing that he had no recollection of ever even watching a single episode of Beavis and Butthead growing up. And this wasn't the first time anyone had really heard of this. During 1993, when the story was fresh, the neighbors of the kid that set the trailer on fire came forward stating the same exact thing, that they knew their family did not have cable. But for some reason, in the, during that decade, it never caught any attention until Austin came out and said it outright in 2008. Hey Arnold in Kenya. I believe I already mentioned this with the Gravity Falls incident, but there were six cartoons that were banned in Kenya and Hey Arnold was among them. It was banned for a few reasons. Now the first and biggest reason was that it was claimed to have been pushing an LGBTQ agenda. And the second reason was that the whatever entity or thing found that Hey Arnold should be banned believed that the grandfather in the series had too much of a phallic shaped head and here is a picture to get across what exactly they thought they were seeing 
To be completely honest, these claims are a bit out there. Um, I know that the show, for a fact, has come out and confirmed that some of the characters are gay, like the teacher, Mr. Simmons, but to say that the show is pushing an agenda just for having gay characters is a, a little bit of an, over, of an overreaction, in my opinion. Uh, regardless, the show remains banned in Kenya, even now, which is crazy because the show is wildly influential and iconic for being one of the few shows that just has a lot of complex story, complex characters, and emotionally driven plots that really hits you in the heartstrings when done well. And to lose out on all of that just because of a few issues you have with it kind of sucks, but hey, it's Kenya's loss, right? The Great McGrady. This is overall a very serious episode from Arthur that centers around cancer. The school's lunch lady, Mrs. McGrady, mysteriously vanishes from school one day. The kids notice her absence and begin to question why she's been missing. This is where the teacher known as Mr. Ratburn steps in and explains that Mrs. McGrady has been gone from school because she got diagnosed with cancer. This leads many of the students to bring her gifts in the hopes of bringing her spirits up. That is everyone except for one kid named Francine, who for whatever reason seems to be very clearly upset over the entire situation. Uh, but not upset in like an angry way, it's upset in a more oh my god, life is so unfair, I'm in like this despair mood kind of way. One of the kids tries cheering her up by giving her Lance Armstrong's email, urging her to contact him because Lance is a famous biker who managed to beat cancer and recover, and they think that by Francine contacting them, Lance will be able to convince her to not be in such a bad mood. Now, I personally felt like this placement of a celebrity was pretty random. Uh, just to have like a celebrity from real life be brought into the show was a little weird. But nonetheless, uh, Armstrong is contacted by Francine and manages to subside Francine's concern. In fact, the entire episode ends up ending with a pretty uplifting and heartwarming message. Francine holds a bike race that is designed to raise money for cancer research and turns out to be a massive success. At the end of the race, Francine sees Miss McGrady and explains how sorry she was for not visiting her, and then it concludes with Miss McGrady becoming healthy enough to return to class. Overall, this ended up being quite a wholesome episode of Arthur with some great educational awareness surrounding cancer, which begs the question, why is this episode on a list of banned and censored animations? Where is the controversy that got this episode banned? Well, if you know who Lance Armstrong is, might not be that big of a question. But if you don't, here's who this guy is. Uh, Lance Armstrong is essentially a very famous celebrity, and he became a famous celebrity after winning the Tour de France. Or Tour de France, Tour de France, pretty sure it's Tour de France. Uh, but regardless, he won this uh, great bike race and ended up becoming a celebrity because of it. Uh, that and also conjoined with the fact that he was a confirmed cancer survivor. And don't quote me on that. I'm not really entirely sure. Did not research that myself. Uh, but I'm pretty sure he was an, an actual known cancer survivor. So he was a really good role model for kids. And this is why he ended up on Arthur. Because they needed some kind of celebrity role model that had cancer to tie into this entire thing. But if you know who Lance Armstrong is now in 2023, you'll understand exactly why this episode got banned. It was revealed in the following years that he cheated to win the Tour de France, and it would be known as the Lance Armstrong doping case. Not only that, but the fact is he also ruined the lives of those who tried to expose him, or at least he attempted to ruin the lives of those who tried to expose him. So it's no wonder he ended up being the reason this episode was changed. The last known airing of this episode was August 20th of 2012, a few days before Armstrong was charged. Funny enough, the episode remained on streaming platforms fully intact until 2021, when a new version of the episode was released that changed the Armstrong storyline in favor of a new character named Uncle Slam, a professional wrestler who was used in the same exact way that Armstrong's character was, having been a cancer survivor that is brought in to change Francine's view on cancer treatment. That is essentially what exists of the episode today. 
And to leave you with a little comment about Lance Armstrong, uh, just a little fun fact that I found out along the way. I'm pretty sure I read this in an article, and you can correct me if I'm wrong in the comments, but I'm pretty sure I read this little snippet in an article about his doping case. But apparently, like allegedly, that one year, a lot of people were confirmed to be doing, basically just cheating. I'm trying not to use any like buzzwords. Um, but yeah, apparently a lot of people were cheating when they did this case so much that they couldn't figure out who to give the first place trophy to because every single next person in line was confirmed to also be doing the same things that Lance Armstrong was. Just a little fun fact that I found that I thought was crazy. Uh, but yeah, let's move on to the next one. Pingu's Lavatory Story. This is a rather obscure episode of Pingu titled Little Accidents. As the name would suggest, the entire episode is based around going pee in places that you probably shouldn't. Pingu and Pinga go grab a drink together to which Pinga accidentally goes to the bathroom right there on the ground. Pingu notices this and sends her home to which he gets hit with the same exact problem. Only this time, he is unable to find a toilet because his father is using the only one that is available. Using some quick thinking, Pingu rings the doorbell to get his father to come answer it, allowing him to make a dash for the bathroom. Unfortunately, the toilet is too high and he ends up going to the bathroom right then and there. His father gets angry at him and makes him clean the entire mess that he made. And this is where Pingu comes up with the solution to use stilts when his mother comes in and suggests that they build steps for him instead. Concluding the episode with Pingu finally being able to use the toilet without any accidents. A pretty obscure episode with a really, really weird plot. To be honest, I don't really know what to say when it comes to this episode of Pingu because why? Why was it made? It's just such a weird plot to have in a, a like, I don't know, it's so weird looking back that this was an actual episode. But anyways, uh, future broadcasts on BBC and future VHS releases of the episode were heavily edited. And the way in which they were edited was by cutting the scene where Pingu goes on the floor as well as cutting parts of the scene where Pingu walks in on his dad using the bathroom. That is not where the story ends with censorship though, as this episode ended up being banned entirely from broadcasting and any home video distribution from essentially the entire world, except for UK and Canada. Scrub me mama with the boogie beat. Much like the censored 11, this short was banned for its controversial use of blackface as well as its depiction of black characters. The short in question is titled Scrub Me Mama with a Boogie Beat. The title comes from a 1941 hit by the same name, and it was written by Don Ray. This song is the centerpiece of this short, with it being the climax of the entire animation. This cartoon starts by setting the scene of Lazy Town which features primarily African-American residents that all look like stereotyped versions of themselves. Not really off to a great start. Uh, the residents are then encouraged to work when a light-skinned woman begins singing Scrub Me Mama, starting a montage of the entire townsfolk getting up and working to make their town a lively community. With the entire short showcasing a lot, and I mean a lot of really really distasteful imagery what's crazy to me is how people created this and thought it was a really wonderful idea like who greenlit this it's honestly just mind-boggling how different times were back then uh, it's important to keep in mind that a lot of these really old cartoons are simply a product of their time but my god like it's insane to think how normalized racism was back in the 1940s and it's still an ongoing battle today but looking back on stuff like this makes you realize just how blatant people were with it even crazier than the fact that this short exists is the attempts to get this short banned it was originally released in 1941 and re-released in 1948 this prompted the NAACP to write Universal a letter outlining the blatant racism and, as they put it, vicious caricature of black life in the South, citing that it depicted black people as lazy and only activated by swing music. And to be completely honest, I don't see how you could watch this cartoon and think anything different. Nine days after receiving this letter, 
Universal responded with one of the most insane responses, where they detailed how no theater had received complaints about the film. Gee, I wonder why. And you know, for those that are wondering why no theaters would have complaints about this, it's probably because uh, people back then felt scared to talk talk back about this. Like, imagine going as as a black person going up to like a white cashier or like a white manager and trying to complain about this to them. Like. I can't imagine being in that position. So of course no theaters would have complained about this. And to be honest, I don't even know where they what they played this film at, but I can't imagine it would have been in black communities. It probably would have been in a lot of white communities who probably would have accepted the film. So that as an argument is already pretty, pretty bad. But anyways, a few days later, the NAACP got into contact with Universal's sales distribution chief. E. L. McAvoy, or I might be mispronouncing him, uh, but this guy defended the cartoon's blatant racism. I'll repeat that again. This guy actually defended the blatant racist imagery riddled within this cartoon. And eventually this would end with Universal announcing that the studio was withdrawing the film. And you would think that would be the end of it, but it's not. <laughs> the cartoonist who made this short was Walter Lance. And I don't know if this guy is trolling or if he's playing dumb on purpose, but he was supposedly shocked that people thought that this cartoon had any racist themes in it. Apparently he thought that what he made was not racist in the slightest. And I already said this a little bit before, but I don't know how you can watch this cartoon and not see how horrible it must feel for your culture to be depicted in such a manner. Uh, thankfully, Lance did end up making an effort in his future cartoons uh, to exclude any type of offensive caricatures of any racial or ethnic groups. So props to him for making the change, but I feel like it was, I feel like that's just the bare minimum when making stuff like that. But regardless, he was also a major reason as to why Scrub Me Mama was pulled. He, he supposedly was a huge advocate for wanting the distribution of the cartoon to cease. So we might have Lance to thank for that. Um, but yeah, it's crazy that this cartoon even existed. And um, for those who are curious to see any of the cartoons on this list, not just Scrub Me Mama, but most of these can be found on YouTube, Daily Motion, Vimeo, or just the general internet. You can just look them up on Google, just type in the title or whatever. I used to put them in the comment section or in the uh, description, but I've since decided to not, just not do that just because, not because it's a lot of work, but because I don't feel comfortable spreading that kind of stuff. If I do see enough people wanting me to put that stuff in the description, I'll be more than happy to do it. But I remember seeing, I just remember feeling weird about the whole situation. I always feel weird when I upload stuff like this. But anyways, I just wanted to say that really quickly. Let's go on to the next one. Quarantined Crab. This episode of Spongebob centers around the usual gang whose peace is disrupted when a familiar face shows up. If you're a longtime Spongebob enjoyer, then you should recognize the health inspector from the Nasty Patty episode. He makes a reappearance in this episode as the health inspector, only this time he has a device that scans for illnesses and diseases. He determines that the Krusty Krab is infested with something called the Crab Flu and puts the restaurant under immediate quarantine. Now, Mr. Krabs tries to subside everyone's fear by explaining that if they find out anyone is infected, they'll simply throw them in the freezer because that's what him and his crew on his boat used to do back when they had the same exact illness. They would just simply throw people in the freezer and kind of forget about them until it was time for them to come out of their quarantine. Then the rest of the episode is this gag where basically every single person that's in the store besides Mr. Krabs shows a sliver of a symptom, uh, you know, like sneezing or something. And then Mr. Krabs freaks out and he's like, the freezer! And he sends everyone into the freezer one by one, you know, leading to everyone that's in the freezer revolting against Mr. Krabs because now all of a sudden they think Mr. Krabs is the one that's sick. A uh, fight between all the characters happens and then it's interrupted by the health inspector who explains that he made a mistake and the clam flu was not actually in the Krusty Krab. The episode was pulled from the air all the way up until April of 2022 
for the obvious parallels to the real world problem of the COVID-19 pandemic. The episode served almost a two year ban from the internet, only being available on Amazon Prime and iTunes in 2022, and then coming back to Paramount Plus in 2023. What doesn't make sense to me is that the episode was made in 2020, right? This is when the pandemic was, in my opinion, at its highest peak interest. And even after the fact, even years, even now, it's not like the pandemic is really over or COVID went away. The problem just kind of stopped being talked about. My point is, why even make the episode in the first place if you knew for a fact that it might not be a good idea for it to be on the air? I guess the thought process here was that Nickelodeon was hesitant to expose children to the reality of the situation that most of us were living in because again to be honest this was basically happening everywhere on at least in the u.s i can only relate with my own personal experience right um, but i imagine everywhere in the world shutdowns of restaurants and businesses were happening every other day at least that's how it was where i was living at and it's weird to release this episode but whatever the case it did eventually find its way back onto streaming services just a few years after it was banned. Quest of the Red Skull. This episode comes from Spider-Man and his amazing friends, specifically an episode titled The Quest of the Red Skull. The plot entails Spider-Man and his amazing friends finding one of the Red Skull's hidden bases. It's revealed here at the Red Skull's base that he has a ton of powerful rockets that he has in the hopes of starting World War III and allowing the Nazi party to rise into power. The more I talk about this episode, the more clear it becomes as to why it was taken off the air. The episode has a ton of imagery and references to Red Skull's association with the Nazi party, showing obvious symbols right in front of the viewer's eyes. There's even parts where the characters will just straight up say, Hail Hitler, and seeing as this is a kid's TV show, NBC decided that it was best to cut the episode in its entirety and never showed any reruns after some of the first few airings. As I said before in the video, probably many times, it can be found pretty easily on all types of platforms being purchasable on Prime, YouTube, and iTunes, but the episode does remain unavailable to watch on Disney+. Plus. What's weird about this entire situation after the episode aired and was taken off of the air was how Disney worked around Red Skull's origins when it came to the Captain America movies because going forward they didn't want that association to be there anymore but I'm like pretty sure in the comics and obviously in this episode he has really deep ties into Nazism so when it came to making the Captain America movies if you've watched them that's why we have his own party basically Red Skull in the lore of this world created his own party that he calls Hydra and Hydra takes some obvious, clear inspiration from the Nazi party. Hail Hydra. This is going to bring us to layer 7 of today's video. And with layer 7, we're going to start off with the first one, Barbecuer. If you're a huge fan of Dexter's Laboratory, then you might already know this one. During Dexter's Laboratory, there would be these segments that would be titled Dial M for Monkey, where you would see Dexter's pet monkey using superpowers and can be seen fighting crime. There is one episode or one short of Dial M for Monkey that was titled Barbecuer. There are two villains in this short that are very obvious parodies of other famous Marvel characters. First, we have Barbecuer, a gigantic alien entity who has a love for cooking, with him clearly being based off of Galactus. And then we have his sidekick, the Silver Spooner, a silver entity that flies around on a silver spoon, an obvious spoof of Marvel's Silver Surfer. The episode itself is pretty harmless. The Barbecuer and the Silver Spooner are trying to cook up a meal. The only problem is, Barbecuer wants his main course to be a cooked up planet Earth. And I mean that literally, the entire planet Earth. He plans on making a giant shish kebab out of the planets and eating it. So through the plot, Monkey and his friends catch wind of Barbecuer's intentions with planet Earth when Silver Spooner comes down and takes their condiments. And now it's 
up to Monkey to not just save the Earth, but all of the other planets from being eaten in this giant planet shish kebab. The monkey ends up succeeding and the world is saved. And like I said, the episode's pretty harmless. It's a pretty normal episode by, you know, like Dexter's laboratory standards and by Dial M for Monkey standards. Nothing out, nothing out of the ordinary is present in this episode. So why did it get banned? Well, we will get to that. Uh, it was first, it was banned in 1997. A year after it came out in 1996, it was banned in America, Canada, Latin America, and the UK, who all collectively took the episode off the air. Multiple sources on the internet state that the Silver Spooner being a character in the episode was the reason for the ban, with their reasoning being that he is a stereotype of gay men and that he is a parody of Silver Surfer without Marvel's permission. Another additional reason that is given for this episode being banned is the fact that Krunk, who is a Hulk lookalike, ends up getting drunk near the end of the episode. Now, some of this reasoning doesn't really make sense because, first of all, parody law is a thing, right? Parody law exists and it exists solely for people to be protected and make fun of stuff. And if, if anyone's watched like Nathan Fielder's show, you can see just how far you can take parody law. But what's weird is they somehow didn't, it didn't get used here, which is crazy because it, I think it's very clear this is an obvious spoof of the character. And it's not so similar to the character that it warrants this kind of takedown, which leads me to believe that the only culprits of it getting taken down are Krunk getting drunk at the end of the episode and the stereotyping, which would be probably not what Disney wants you to think they're taking episodes of shows down for. Hef in a handbasket. Going to hell in a handbasket is a famous phrase that means a situation that is inescapably heading for disaster. An episode of Rocco's Modern Life put one of the main characters' names in the phrase and boom, we are left with the episode title, Hef in the handbasket. Just a little fun fact for anybody that wanted to know. This episode is all about Heifer going on a dark game show that will net him a big trip if he manages to win. The big trip in question is heavily alluded to be a trip to hell, or in this case, a parody of hell that they call Heck. Hef needs 666 points to prevail, and in order to ensure he wins, the host, whose name is Peaches, gives him 665 points. Although it takes a frustrating amount of time for Hef to win one single point, he does. And as a result, he is sent to Heck. Only one problem, Hef's grandmother is down in Heck and doesn't really want him there. She wants him gone because he's disturbing her peace and quiet. So, you know, the plot ends up getting resolved, yada, yada, yada. Why is it banned? You know, if it wasn't, super clear it, it is because of the references to hell and also heifer basically selling his soul in the episode nick didn't like this episode so much that it was banned off of their nick rewind block up until february 14th of 2021 it was also not shown on nicktoons and it's really funny because the banning of this episode led to a really funny workaround that nickelodeon had to employ because at the time, and I'm pretty sure this is a normal thing for cartoons to do, but I'm a 90, I'm like a 90s, early 2000s kid, so I don't know if this is still a normal thing. I don't really have cable at all, or I don't, and I don't watch any kid shows from modern times, like super duper kid shows. But back in the day, most episodes of cartoons for children would be two tiny shorts that were like 10 minutes each, and they would just splice them together. If you've ever watched SpongeBob, it's literally the same exact thing. And for, in this case of Rocco's Modern Life, uh, the episode known as Hef in the Handbasket was paired with another one known as Wallaby on Wheels. But because of censorship, they obviously couldn't show the Hef episode. So they were just left with Wallaby on Wheels, this other project that they didn't want to go to waste. So what they ended up doing was pairing Wallaby on Wheels with an episode from season one titled Bedfellows. And that was what ended up getting pushed onto Nicktoons whenever they did reruns of that specific episode. Just not a little fun fact that I thought would be kind of cool to talk about. Cause again, when, when am I ever going to get a chance to talk about these kinds of things? Stewart's house. 
This episode of Beavis and Butthead has a pretty simple plot, as most of the episodes do. Essentially, the duo wanted to watch a show called Death Truck, but it's on pay-per-view, and they obviously can't afford it. So they go to their friend's house as a solution who happens to be named Stuart, hence the name Stuart's House. They go to his house in order to watch it there because for some reason Stuart can afford to pay for this type of stuff on his TV. And from the clips that I found on YouTube of the episode, it's pretty dark, at least in my opinion. They end up bullying Stuart and wreck everything in his home in various ways, from sucking up the cat in the vacuum cleaner to hanging Stuart by a towel hanger and putting objects in his pants. And the kicker that got the episode banned was a scene where the duo begins sniffing gas from a stove. Despite it airing with a disclaimer that states, if you're not a cartoon, stove gas will kill you, the episode was permanently banned following the events of the aforementioned Ohio incident where the kid set his family's trailer on fire. So there goes another episode taken down because of the Ohio incident. But the next episode of Beavis and Butthead that got banned was banned for reasons unrelated to the Ohio incident. Incognito. In this episode, the duo finds themselves in class goofing off when one of their shenanigans causes them to hit a classmate named Earl. They knock his cigarette out of his mouth, which Earl takes as a personal insult and flashes them his gun in a threatening manner. Beavis and Butthead are so scared of this that they try to go incognito by wearing sunglasses and hats, as well as talking in a different accent in the hopes that Earl doesn't recognize them anymore. This obviously doesn't work, and he lets them know by flashing his firearm once more. All of a sudden, a bullet flies through the classroom and hits the chalkboard, and then it's revealed that one of Earl's rivals caused this to happen. The teacher then starts berating Earl, claiming that he's the reason that this bullet got shot in class, and the episode ends up resolving with Earl putting his gun away and thanking the duo for not pinning the incident on him when they could have easily done so. I'm sure most of you can guess why this was taken down, but in case it wasn't obvious, the short was pulled from MTV because people felt that it glorified school violence, or in this case, school shootings, with Earl literally threatening Beavis and Butthead with a firearm. The episode also never made it to home video due to this controversy, and that pretty much does it for Beavis and Butthead episodes that were on this list. There was like four episodes in total, I believe, which is kind of an insane amount for it, this list. I'm surprised there's not more though, considering how controversial that show just was back in the day. But nonetheless, let's move on to the next item on today's iceberg. Hot Spells. Darkwing Duck is an old animated television series that ran from 1991 to 1992. It bears a striking resemblance to another Disney animated series, DuckTales. But in Darkwing Duck, the main character is a superhero named Darkwing Duck and his sidekick Launchpad McQuack as they both go on their various adventures. It seems innocent enough, so why are we talking about it? There was a Halloween special on season two of this series titled Hot Spells, and it had some rather satanic themes that Disney didn't want to be associated with after the fact. The plot centers around Darkwing and his adopted daughter, Gosselin Mallard, on their trip to visit an old friend named Morgana Macabre. They take a visit to her old school of magic. Gosselin is put into a few classes, but finds them to be less than enjoyable, leading her to meeting the school janitor who calls himself BLZ, which we will come to find out is short for Beelzebub, which if you don't know, is another name for Satan. Gosselin relents to BLZ how she is frustrated with learning magic because she feels as though you have to be some kind of mathematical genius in order to do it. BLZ is eating up this vulnerability by showing her the dark magic, which is far easier to perform. We soon find out he is reeling her to the dark side in order to capture Darkwing Duck. This is where the episode takes somewhat of a darker turn. Beelzebub interrupts the big school presentation and presents Darkwing Duck with a hard decision. He shows him that he's captured his friend Morgana, but allows him to sacrifice himself in her place, to which he agrees. Darkwing is then sucked into what I can only believe is hell. Now it's up to Gosselin to save her father. Spoilers, 
she does she ends up saving him and everything goes back to normal as expected from cartoons like this the clear references to devil and satanic imagery is what got this episode banned from the air it never got any type of vhs or dvd release and it remains unavailable to watch on disney plus as far as halloween episodes go i actually really enjoyed watching this one i find it odd that they decided to ban this episode because i mean i personally didn't feel off put by anything um, then again i don't think i'm the type of person that would be i guess insulted or would speak out against this type of imagery but what's really strange is that clips from this specific episode can be found in promotional ads for darkwing duck after the fact right after this episode was banned you can find promotional clips using this episode for it, which is kind of strange. Uh, speaking of which, I noticed something when trying to find the promotional clips to use as B-roll for this section. Why can't we get promos like this anymore? Look how wacky and fun this was. I feel like as we've gotten older, we've kind of lost the charm that old TV promotions used to have. Now everything is so corporate cookie cutter and just less imaginative and creative. I just thought I'd share this in case anyone else felt the same way because when I was watching these promotional clips, I was like, wow, like we just don't, we don't seem to get anything like this anymore. What was that? Darkwing Duck is on the attack. This is where you'll find a man, fighting crime like a maniac. Go Darkwing, go Darkwing, go Darkwing. Mini takes care of Pluto. Mickey Mouse Works is an old animated series that sought to bring the magic of the 1930s golden era cartoons to the 2000s. It's a pretty charming series with one little exception. Minnie takes care of Pluto. This was aired in January of the year 2000 and faced a ton of controversy surrounding the plot. Mickey drops off Pluto at Minnie's house in the hopes that she can take care of him for the day. This greatly upsets her as she planned on getting some spring cleaning done and makes it clear by yelling at Pluto to stay out of her way. It's at this point that Pluto's good and evil conscience manifest themselves as the devil and as an angel, with the devil convincing Pluto that Minnie is out to get him. The demon conscience is what leaves us with these really disturbing moments in the episode, which include a sequence where Minnie poisons Pluto's food, one where she buries him alive, and another where she tries to kill him with a mace. And the last being a literal representation of Pluto burning in hell. To be fair, the episode does end with Pluto realizing that all of this was just in his head, and Minnie really wasn't out to get him. Uh, but I, I just want to make it clear that while I watched this episode, because I, I did watch almost everything on the iceberg, when I watched this one, it genuinely made me feel a little uneasy at times, which is kind of weird because I did not get that feeling when I watched Hot Spells, for example, which is arguably a, a little bit worse and it has the exact same type of imagery. Uh, maybe something about it being Pluto might have triggered it because, I mean, who doesn't love this little guy? Even if you hate Disney, you can't tell me that this isn't a cute character. But nevertheless, ABC pulled this episode and it never aired in the US again. Also never finding its way to be a Disney Plus release as of yet. It however can still be seen outside of the US. It's frequently aired on international feeds of Disney Channel and Toon Disney. Supernova. This episode of Buzz Lightyear of Star Command was strangely in touch with reality so if you struggle with addiction or anything of, of thoughts or anything related to addiction you should probably skip and go to the next cartoon but anyways this episode begins with the star command team being in a bit of a pickle on the brink of dying their last resort is for space ranger mira nova to phase through an energy source in order to shut down the big bad machine she does so and slowly but surely she becomes addicted to the power that she gained from walking through it's really depressing to watch if you've been a person that struggled with addiction or you know if you're like me you've helped a friend overcome an addiction of theirs this episode does a really good job of portraying what kind of what it's like the first person to tell her to stop 
is her father, who notices her new liking to this power source and warns her to not give into this desire before it becomes a problem. She refuses to listen and goes throughout her day with the energy boost helping her productivity. Her father then tries again to stop her from continuing on this path to which she relents that it's her life and why does he care so much. Buzz then tries to get through to her to no avail. She proceeds to keep abusing these streams of energy and she decides to fight Zerg alone as she believes with her newfound powers she can take him no problem. She leaves and at first I'm not gonna lie she's kind of giving them the hands you know but it's not too long before she begins experiencing withdrawal symptoms extreme fatigue and longing for more energy zerg manages to capture the rest of the space rangers and uses an energy source to lure mira into a trap this scene right here is what did it for me the desperate look on mira's face alongside the joyfulness of knowing that she's about to have her addiction fed right then and there like i said before those who have dealt with this will know this situation all too well there's that energy nearby i can feel it mira you gotta fight the urge energy core nearby buzz i, I can ghost in I, I power up don't even think about it that's how we got into this mess in the first place mira comes to her senses and refuses to stay inside the energy source using sheer willpower to stop herself and put an end to Zerg's plans. It then ends with Mira apologizing to everybody, which is a nice ending to this rather serious episode. I'm interested in hearing what others think about this episode. I've read in some of the comments that people interpreted Mira's actions as bipolar disorder, and that seems somewhat valid, but I personally see this episode as a realistic portrayal of addiction and the withdrawals that come with it. I'll leave a link below to this one so that you can come to your own conclusion. Stokey the Bear The Adventures of Rocky and Bullwinkle and Friends is an American animated series that aired from 1959 to 1964. Typically it would feature who you expected. It would be Rocky, Bullwinkle, and their friends. A short that would play as a segment during episodes of Rocky and Bullwinkle was a short known as Dudley Do Right of the Mounties, which featured the aptly named character Dudley Do Right. One short of this series was titled Stokey the Bear, featuring a parodied version of Smokey the Bear. And yeah, I know it's technically not Smokey the Bear, it's Smokey Bear. You know, we've all heard the Mandela effect on this, but regardless, it's a parody of Smokey Bear that can be found during this segment. Only in this short, the bear that cares about fire doesn't care about fire. Stokey the bear instead likes to set fires on basically everything in sight. This is because he is under the hypnotic magic of Snidely Whiplash, leading Stokey the bear who would normally fight forest fires to instead start them. The entire episode just deals with Dudley Do Right trying to find and put a stop to Stokey the Bear through various comedic sequences. What struck me as odd while watching this cartoon was the ending because it didn't really resolve much of anything. Dudley finds Stokey the Bear and you would think he would break the trance or do something. He would do something to fix Stokey the Bear's problem with setting fires but instead what ends up happening is he simply moves him to Chicago where Stokey burns down the entire city. And that's literally how the short just ends. At first glance, you would think this got taken down because of the obvious use of fire, right? Because we've seen on a lot of things on this iceberg, companies hate fire and they'll still make episodes with fire in it for some reason. But that is not why this was taken down. This is actually taken down because of Stokey the Bear, the character being used. They didn't like that Stokey the Bear was a parody of Smokey Bear. The US Forest Service protested against the episode as they, again, did not like this parodied version of their beloved character. And it's strange because, as I've said earlier, there's parody law. This type of stuff is almost always protected under parody law, but it seems as though a few cases here and there will slip by, which seems a bit scummy to me. But I think this is one of the more positive turnouts of that rolling not being used because I personally found the short to not be the greatest message for kids. Uh, but in other cases like the barbecue, it just doesn't make sense to me because it just ruins the fun that people had enjoying those segments. 
flight as a feather. I want to preface this by saying I love the mask. The movie and Jim Carrey are simply iconic, but did anyone know that there was an animated television series that followed the movie? Because I honestly had no idea. And this is most likely because I wasn't alive when the series dropped. Uh, I was born in 1999 and I'm pretty sure the series came out in 1997, but I still feel like I would know that. Uh, but anyways, this episode is specifically titled Flight as a Feather and it is featured in the Mask TV series. The plot for this one is a little bit all over the place, so I'm just going to talk about the part that got it banned. During a big city ceremony, an exotic dancer by the name of Cookie comes in who is said to have dated the mayor of said city. And when she comes in, she barges in with explosives on herself, essentially threatening to kill the mayor and everyone there by exploding herself alongside the entire crowd. The mask then comes in to save the day by turning Cookie's explosives into a drink for himself, all the while Cookie is exposed with no clothes in front of these two men. The 90s, man, when people could get away with this kind of stuff in cartoons. And I feel like what I just said could be interpreted as a, I miss this kind of stuff, but I really don't. I'm just simply pointing out how the times were. It's crazy. Like doing this entire iceberg has single-handedly showed me how much cartoons have changed just in the last few decades. Uh, whether you think it's for better or for worse is your own opinion, but I just simply had some food for thought that I wanted to share. And it's just crazy. Uh, this kind of stuff would never even have a chance of being aired in modern times. Sugar Time, Heinsberg, Vermont. We've seen plenty about Arthur, but we have yet to talk about the spin-off show, Postcards from Buster. An episode released in 2005 titled Sugar Time, Heinsberg, Vermont was, you guessed it, banned. And it was banned only in the United States. And usually I would go into detail about what the episode's plot was to give you context as to how the thing that got it banned played into the episode, but I feel as though for this one you don't really need that context. It's a pretty obvious reason as for why this one was banned. It proudly featured a lesbian couple in the episode, which sparked a ton of controversy over that decision. And what's insane is how well hid the episode remained. It aired in 2005, and it remained lost media until May 25th of 2015. Nearly a decade after its initial airing was the episode once seen again. I think the reason this one was shelved so quickly as compared to the other LGBTQ controversial episodes is because postcards from Buster would feature real live actors. So the lesbian couple that was being represented in the episode was being represented with real photos of them together and with Buster physically visiting their home in the real world, which may have been a little bit too real for those parents that spoke out against the cartoon. The Big Drip. I guess history repeats itself because an episode of Jimmy Two Shoes has almost the same premise as the Pingu Lavatory episode, in which the main protagonist has to use the bathroom, but for one reason or another, can't find a place to use it. It apparently remains unaired in the US, but it managed to find its way onto UK broadcasting, and it's a little odd because Wikipedia sites and wiki websites say that it was banned for dark humor, while others will say that it was for peeing jokes. But whatever the issue was, it never aired in the US because of these problems that the executives had with the show's plot. And I just find it really, it's just weird that they would label this dark humor. Cause after watching the episode, I don't really understand what they mean. I just think it's weird that somehow two things on this iceberg have to do with like this same plot. Like why? Someone give me a reason. Do you guys think that it's funny? Or entertaining I don't get it whatever we'll go on to the next one the kitchen Casanova if you're a 90s kid that grew up on Cartoon Network you should remember a show by the name of what a cartoon the ambitious anthology series that gave birth to all your Cartoon Network favorites like Johnny Bravo the Powerpuff Girls Dexter's Laboratory and so much more I actually didn't know about what a cartoon until making this video so you can imagine how flabbergasted I was when I found out that all of these iconic cartoons 
had their start on an anthology series that was just meant to produce as many separate cartoons for kids as possible. And it's crazy just how many of these got their start on this show. Now, enough praising the show, let's talk about Kitchen Casanova, an infamous short that was spawned out of the series. It features a man that is nervously preparing for a date. Having invited someone over for dinner at his house, there are various problems the man runs into when the date arrives, such as this pot boiling over, his chicken burning in the oven, and the reason that the short was banned, slicing his finger off while cutting some carrots. Cartoon Network did not shy away from these types of graphic visuals back then, and to be honest, I'm making it sound worse than it was. Uh, of course, I don't think it's good for kids to watch these things because I don't want them to try and replicate it themselves, but all in all, I don't think this short was entirely deserving of being banned. I wasn't able to find a clear timeline on when this episode was banned, but it does appear to be taken off rather quickly as most sources cite that it never aired after the first initial airings. And before we move on, I gotta mention this hilarious comment I saw because it pretty much sums up my thoughts on the matter. A show gets pulled off the air because the main character slices his fingers and there's blood. Oh my god. But of course, when a coyote blows himself up with TNT or a mouse hits a cat with a huge anvil on its head, it's perfectly fine. I'd say that this comment represents probably a lot of people watching, including myself right now. It's This is a good comment. <laughs> I had to mention it for this. It was too funny. The police competition. In light of the George Floyd situation, Nickelodeon began taking down any police-themed episodes from future airings and from on-demand platforms. One of the shows that they removed a police episode from was the Bubble Guppies. That should immediately strike you as odd because you'd think they would only remove episodes or cartoons that showed any type of police authority or brutality, but no. They think taking down an innocent episode of the Bubble Guppies is showing support for the horrific situation that was the George Floyd accident. And this is what I'm talking about. It feels like big corporations are always making these right decisions but in the wrong places like how do you seriously believe that taking down an episode from the bubble guppies is solving the issue of spreading acceptance of police brutality like really i don't know that's just my two cents i think their efforts could have been used better by actually looking for content that's promoting that idea but let me know your thoughts below and it, whether or not you disagree with me or not. I just, I'd just i love to hear more opinions on this because I feel like I'm just going to keep telling myself the same thing. I feel like I'm going crazy reading this kind of stuff. Puka. The original entry for this part of the iceberg was a specific episode titled Romancing the Clone of a show named Puka. But upon further research, the one episode isn't the sole reason for the show being banned because apparently the entire series is banned from the US and Europe as a whole. The show in question is called Puka, and it's about a young girl who is in love with a ninja named Garu. And when I say in love, I should really be saying obsessed, because this girl does not take no for an answer. When it came out in 2006, no one really batted an eye because, I mean, it was a cute series at the time. But in hindsight, it's just clear that the show has way more SA in it than actual funny love, with Puka repeatedly not taking no for an answer and forcing herself on her love interest Garu all the time throughout the show. And to make matters worse, did I mention the children are children? They're 12 and 11 years old respectively. It, that's pretty much all there is to talk about this cartoon, and I will say that finding this information was not easy, like at all. Finding information on any of the other entries on this iceberg was as simple as going onto Google and just, you know, typing some kind of combination of this cartoon band controversy or some combination of that. And when I typed in Puka, when I would type in Puka controversy or Puka band or romancing the clone band, romancing the clone controversy, nothing would pop up. I had to find out about this through a few articles that were just really obscure and it was just weird. It, it was weird to me that there wasn't really any articles that showed up immediately talking about the clear SA that is present in the show that got it banned. Um, 
that's just what I, I wanted to point that out beforehand because if you're gonna go research this one yourself you might find trouble doing so and I thought it was a little weird and whenever I see these things that are a little weird I just have to believe that it's because either the show is just that obscure of a gem and there's not enough press for people to have covered it or they paid people off and they're trying to get people to not see that they're making shows like this that is going to be the end of today's video this one took me a long time to get out and it's oh man the research i'm so tired right now it's like 12 a.m right now as i'm recording this and man i am just ready to knock out um but this was fun i this was probably one of my favorite icebergs that i've researched um i originally started this iceberg because i was getting bored if you go watch my accountability video i don't think i, I don't know if i went over this or not but um basically at the time of making this iceberg video i had three other icebergs on my channel i had the disturbing media iceberg which was still um, iceberg series and now it's a normal series on my channel i was still doing the disneyland series which was now also obviously now it's finished and i also finished i was finishing up the chart of truth which is still ongoing it's gonna be ongoing for months but i started this one because i got just bored you know i got bored doing the other iceberg series and i was like i need something to kind of bring me back and this was the one that got me back into it and honestly i have this iceberg to thank for getting me this far because i don't think i would have come back to youtube if i didn't find this so shout outs to whoever made this iceberg chart uh, i'll probably put them and credit them in the i'll find them right now i'm gonna go find them really quickly i have them right here humongous shout out to shiny shiny tomato on reddit for making this iceberg um yeah it really it did get me back into wanting to do this and i'm happy that it did and yeah I'm, i really have any, any much else to say besides that i'm just happy that i'm back um and it, it i'm not gonna lie i'm a little sad that this series is finishing because i'm just i don't know it, it is a little bit of a special series to me for being the one that got me back into it and looking at my channel and seeing like the scooby-doo iceberg the Serb media iceberg the disneyland iceberg all done seeing all three of those done and then seeing this one done too it's like the end of an era almost for me and i'm like kind of just sitting here like damn you know like two years ago these were all like not even close to being finished and now they're all just done and i'll probably make another video going over that feeling later but wanted to talk about it right now um but without further ado uh let's get to the patron shout out so humongous thanks to everybody that is on screen i'm gonna start pushing the patreon a lot more in the coming months because i am switching everything up as of august 1st this video will probably get uploaded after august 1st but yeah i'm gonna be making some big changes to the patreon so if you're watching this right now uh tier three tier two and tier one are all offering the same exact benefits you can get everything on my on my patreon for the low low price of three bucks the only thing you do not get is the end game the end of the video credits no one else is going to get this besides tier three so if you're on here thank you so much for choosing to support the patreon and thank you a lot for choosing the support at the level that you're at it's actually kind of sick um i didn't think people would actually choose this tier out of sheer generosity but i'm wrong <laughs> and i love being proven wrong so thank you to everyone that is on there huge shout outs to just if you're a super donor i have some super donors on the the patreon that are just crazy and i love you all you guys are amazing and yeah with all that said i will see every single one of you in the next video thanks for watching